This time let's take 35.8 grams of water, but I'm going to start it at 52.6 degrees Celsius. And I want to know how much energy is required to heat it to 114.8 degrees Celsius. Now you're told you can assume normal atmospheric conditions. That simply means that the boiling point of water is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. So we're going to have to transition through that boiling point, just like we did in the last problem. But unlike last problem, I'm not starting at the boiling point. When we think about the energy it takes to heat or cool water, we have to consider the energy of the phase changes. This phase change down here, the heat of fusion, for freezing or melting water, and then the phase change we've just been dealing with, this heat of vaporization for boiling or condensing water. In this problem, we're starting at a temperature around here. As I add energy, that water is going to warm up but then once it hits the phase change, in this case boiling, the temperature levels off. The energy is no longer going into increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. The energy is now going into breaking apart those intermolecular bonds and undergoing the phase change. It's not until the phase change is done that you see the temperature increase again. So in this problem, I'm going to have to start down here. I'm going to have to warm the water up to the boiling point. Then I'm going to have to boil it. And once the water is boiled, I can then get to my final temperature. So this is actually a three-step problem. So let's find out how much energy it takes to get from the initial temperature of 52.6 up to the boiling point, then how much energy it takes to boil it, and then finally, how much energy it takes to get from the boiling point to the final temperature. So we begin by warming the liquid up to the boiling point. We are going to go from 52.6 degrees Celsius up to 100 degrees Celsius. That means our water is going to be a liquid at that point. Well, whenever we have a temperature change, we know how to find the energy associated with it. We're going to say Q equals C times M times delta T, where the specific heat is going to be the specific heat of liquid water, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. The mass is 35.8 grams. And the change in temperature is 47.4 degrees Celsius. So when I do that step, I get an energy of 7,093 joules. Once it's up to the boiling point, then we can boil the liquid. So our Q here is going to equal our heat of vaporization times the number of moles, just like it did in the last problem. So that's going to equal 40.7 kilojoules per mole then I have to convert the 35.8 grams into moles. So I get 1.99 moles of water. And when I do that calculation, I get 80.9 kilojoules. Well, now that it's boiled, it's all a gas. So I can take it from the boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, to the final temperature. And as I said before, it is now a gas. So temperature change, so I'm going to do specific heat again but I'm going to use the specific heat of gaseous water, 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. Q equals C times M times delta T, 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. Mass hasn't changed, so it's still 35.8 grams. And now our change in temperature is 14.8 degrees Celsius, and I get 1,065 joules. So to find the total energy here, we just have to add them up. But I do want to caution you about units. I have joules, kilojoules, and joules here. So make sure that you are adding up similar units. So what I'll do is I'll take my joules and convert them to kilojoules first. So I'm going to call this 7.093 kilojoules. And I'm going to call this 1.065 kilojoules. So that when I add up all of my values, I get 89.1 kilojoules of energy. Notice that the vast, vast majority of my energy goes into boiling the water in this process. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to break all those intermolecular forces apart. The energy it takes to warm up the liquid and less so warm up the gas is much less than it takes to break apart those intermolecular forces. I'd like to close this video in this chapter with of one dose of the real world not being as cut and dry as a chemistry class. It is actually possible to supercool a liquid or superheat a liquid, meaning you can get a liquid down below its freezing point and it will still stay a liquid, or you can get a liquid up above its boiling point and it can still be a liquid. These situations aren't very stable, but they do happen.
The reason is that crystals and bubbles sometimes have a hard time forming. In order for crystals or bubbles to form, you have to have particles come together and hold on to each other. And it's easier if you can get a seed crystal or the start of a bubble that latches onto a surface and then other particles can kind of join in. This is referred to having a nucleation site. This is why if you drink a clear carbonated beverage, either a soda water or a Sprite, if you take a look at your glass, you'll see streams of bubbles that seem to come from one part of your glass. Those are little chips or scratches on the inside of the glass that are nucleation sites, that are places where bubbles have an easier time forming. If you have a really smooth surface, and you very carefully heat the substance up, you can get the water to heat up and heat up and heat up, and bubbles will have such a hard time forming that it will actually go past the boiling point. This happens sometimes in microwaves with really nice cups. When you're heating up water for tea, for example, if you heat it up too long, you can actually get the water warmer than 100 degrees Celsius. The problem is it's unstable, so the second you open the microwave and shake that cup a little bit as you pull it out, all of that water could boil instantly. It can actually kind of explode in your face and cause serious burns. Likewise, you can do the same thing if you carefully cool a glass of water in the freezer. You can cool it and cool it and cool it, and then when you pull it out, it's still liquid water, but it's below zero degrees Celsius. If you jostle it and move it a little bit, the whole thing will freeze instantly. And a neat thing that happens is that if you measure the temperature, you've gotten it below the freezing point. So as you jostle it and it freezes, it actually raises temperature to get up to the freezing point, will solidify, and then cool back down to the temperature it was before.